It's about us as Canadians and the community sending a message to the victims' families that yes, we recognize that this is not one lost life. But now all of that is in jeopardy after a recent Supreme Court ruling calling it unconstitutional. Uh, we saw some of the worst murderers, including Derek Soretsky, a triple murderer, who among his victims was an infant, uh, successfully appeal uh, his parole ineligibility period, seeing that slashed from 75 years to 25 years. In my thoughts, I feel that they, uh, they're they basically kind of saying, well, doesn't matter if you polish off one person, three people, four, it really doesn't matter. You're, you're only going to get the, the maximum 25 years for your wrongdoing, which is totally not right. This is Kerry Diot for Rebel News. The Edmonton area parents of a security guard murdered while on the job are still living the nightmare of his death. But now, thanks to a Supreme Court ruling and inaction by the Liberal government, their pain is even worse. Three armored car guards are dead. Another is in hospital clinging to life, and the manhunt continues this hour for one of their colleagues. Edmonton police frantically use a battering ram to reach a seriously wounded guard just minutes after the shooting. He's locked in the room behind the ATM, his dead colleagues right beside him. On that particular evening, when it was Brian's shift, he was upset about something. Mike and I were eating at the Swiss Chalet, having a late supper, and he said, Mom, I just want to quit. I said, what's going on? And he said, no, I don't, I, I don't want to talk about it now, but I, I just want to walk off the job. And I thought to myself, oh, okay. So I said, we'll talk about it in the morning. And he said, yeah, if I get there. And I thought, oh, that's weird. Um, previous to that, he had some suspicions about he, a coworker. He said, um, he said, you know, one night he, he said, Mama, I, I work in a dangerous job. And I said, oh, but you know, God will protect you. And now those words kind of eat me up. But uh, the, the other thing that came to mind is uh, he had approached the union rep that night and he wanted to quit. And the union rep that night said, just get through your shift and we'll talk about it tomorrow morning. So that poor person has that to live with. Here's the man police are looking for, 21-year-old Travis Brandon Baumgartner, initially described as just a person of interest. Late this afternoon, police called him a suspect. Investigators tell us Baumgartner was the fifth armored guard on duty. The team was delivering money to the ATMs at the north end of Hub Mall shortly after midnight this morning. Baumgartner has not been seen since the shootings. We are dealing today with what can only be described as a horrific act of violence. Police will not say whether Baumgartner acted alone, but they do tell us the brazen multiple killing was part of a targeted plan. This was not a random attack. The international manhunt for Baumgartner is on. Quickly showered and I drove down to the university hospital because on the news they did say there was an injured party, one still alive. Got to the university, I tried to find out who it was. I had no luck with that. So then the next steps I took was I drove to the compound where G4 is. It was on the south side, or probably still is, I believe. The road was blocked off. Spoke to the constables on the road there, and I told them who I was. And I said, is there anyone, somehow, can somebody give us some information? Because we're, you know, we need to know. So he directed me to one of the parking lots close to there. As I waited in the vehicle, there was a detective that was walking towards the vehicle. And just in his demeanor and the way he was coming towards the vehicle, he opened the passenger door, came into the vehicle. First thing I said to him, it's not good, is it? And he said, no, it's not. Following that, the my, our other sons were phoning, trying to find out what was going on. Well, our, our one son, Greg, he actually did drive to the area, and I took him aside, <laughs> took him aside and told him what happened. That affected us pretty hard. That was a big part of our lives, you know. He rose the two of us together. 
it's been hard. While no judgment will bring back the victims, the sentence is historic. An offender convicted of multiple murders will now face more than 25 years of parole ineligibility. It was dealt with. He pled guilty, was sentenced to 40 years, first time since the new ruling that anyone had been sentenced to that. And we felt not a little bit of comfort knowing that we're not going to hopefully have to worry about this for 40 years. And now it's a whole different situation. Baumgartner was the first Canadian to be sentenced to life in prison without the chance of parole for 40 years. This law was brought in under the Harper government and it allowed judges the discretion to sentence that parole ineligibility consecutively instead of concurrently. But now all of that is in jeopardy after a recent Supreme Court ruling calling it unconstitutional. St. Albert MP Michael Cooper says the liberal Liberal government must act now by invoking the notwithstanding clause or by creating a new law. The Elysics fear they could be at a parole hearing and before their son's killer in just 15 years. We were shocked when we heard the news. I think the, the day that Michael phoned us and let us know what was happening, I think our response was, what? How could this be? Uh, and then I started talking to other people, and they had no idea about this ruling. Uh, they had no, uh, we ha I guess we had no indication that this was even going to happen. So I, I think that we are still a little bit in shock. And now, as I understand it, what will happen is that he could be eligible for parole in, within 25 years. You would obviously go there to witness this. Assuming that this person gets turned down, you would be doing this for every year. That that must be a nightmare in your in your thoughts right now. It's, not, no, it's nothing we're looking forward to. We are getting on in the years, and we don't know if we'll even, you know, because his first time around with the new ruling would be in 15 years. Hopefully, we will be around to at least go to that, and we are trying to get our family to sign up for victim notification that, you know, that they can follow up in, in case we, we are not able to. It's, um, it's, it's, it's hard thinking about it and trying not to think about it before you go to bed. And when we wake up in the morning, his picture's on our bedside table, so it's a little bit difficult to not forget. They say that the toughest thing probably on earth is losing a son. Is that something that you've experienced? People do say that, but it's not that we lost a son because people do lose sons and daughters to cancer or accidents, but the way he was taken and the other victims were taken and the manner of the violence of it is very petrifying. How do you cope? Mm. Our faith has kept us strong. Our family has kept us strong. Our support group has kept us very much strong. We have friends that uh, keep in touch with us. We still celebrate his birthday. Uh, we light a candle, we have some cake, we have a glass of wine. We have never forgotten him. He's still very much a part of our lives. And uh, we're, we're happy for the support we have. Even though he you know, didn't earn much money at his living and stuff like that. He still managed uh, his daughter. We got to see his daughter all the time, and he looked forward to that. And he was hoping to have been able to move to Vancouver with his daughter so that they could have set up over there. But that was obviously cut short for him. We do something probably that is unique. We end up going to the Hub Mall on the day in the early hours of the morning of June 15th. And we uh, go to the ATM machine and we lay flowers there and we lay a candle there. We light the candle. We have a quiet song. We say a prayer of reflection. Then walk down those stairs and go out to the tree, the tree that's been planted on behalf of the victims, and uh, we reflect on how well it's doing, how strong it is. And then we go to the gravesite, and family and friends meet us there.
the big question, I think a lot of Canadians were, they, they, they heard this story and they, uh, they were moved by it. It was a vicious, horrible crime. We know that there, there could be other, other ways to deal with this. It's, uh, I know that uh, many people feel that the federal liberal government is fairly soft on crime. I think the federal government we have right now is very soft on a lot of issues. And uh, to be honest, we're very disappointed in their response to what the Supreme Court has done. And by doing so, in my thoughts, I feel that they, they're they basically kind of saying, well, it doesn't matter if you polish off one person, three people, four, it really doesn't matter. You're, you're only going to get the, the maximum 25 years for your wrongdoing, which is totally not right. This provision was put in the criminal code because victims perceived that there was not justice being done, that the additional losses from the uh, second and third deaths wasn't being reflected in the sentence that was imposed. So it's not about Travis Baumgartner. It's about us as Canadians and the community sending a message to the victims' families that yes, we recognize that this is not one lost life. Michael, what could the Liberals have done differently? What a lot of people are, you know, they might throw up their hands and say, well, court decision is a court decision. So what can we do? Um, what do you think they should have done? Uh, they should have, instead of respecting the decision, as the Minister of Justice David Lametti said, uh, he should have recognized that this decision is fundamentally unjust. We're talking about slashing the parole ineligibility period for mass murderers, a rogues gallery of the worst of the worst. And so in the face of that, what the minister should have done is invoked the notwithstanding clause. That is not something that should ever be taken lightly but we would not have a charter without the notwithstanding clause. It is a tool that the government has, that Parliament has, and this is one of those cases where it should have been exercised. As a result of the failure of David Lametti to do so, not only is Aunt Bissonette, the mass murderer who went into a Quebec City mosque and uh, who murdered six people, attempted to murder six others, going to see his parole ineligibility period significantly slashed just last week in Alberta. Uh, we saw some of the worst murderers, including Derek Soretsky, a triple murderer, who among his victims was an infant, uh, successfully appeal uh, his parole ineligibility period, seeing that slashed from 75 years to 25 years. And in the case of Baumgartner, uh, the individual, the criminal responsible for murdering Brian and uh, two others, uh, along with uh, shooting uh, Matthew Schumann, who, who miraculously survived, his lawyer has indicated that uh, he will file an appeal. So the fact that these sentences are being slashed is a direct result of the failure of the minister to act. Now, uh, if the minister is not prepared to invoke the notwithstanding clause, then at the very least, the government should bring in a new law. Uh, this decision pertains to a specific law. Uh, the court's decision did not say that parliament cannot enact a new law that would provide for uh, a parole and eligibility period above 25 years in the case of persons convicted of multiple murders. I know a lot of people look to the United States where somebody, um, mass murders will get 150 years, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's, it's quite clear that if you kill one person, you can get uh, and, and kill six others. And basically, uh, there's no further punishment. That's right. And that was precisely what this law enacted by the previous Harper conservative government sought to address is to end sentencing discounts, to give judges the discretion to be able to fashion a sentence that takes into account each life lost. For Rebel News in Edmonton, Alberta, this is Carrie Diot reporting. 
For more stories you won't find anywhere else, go to rebelnews.com.